Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Matt. I do the uh, videos on the Varsity Bookworm channel, and I have uh, uh, my new friend Garrett here. He's a fellow uh, lover of wisdom, fellow philosopher, and uh, reached out on one of the videos I put out and started talking about uh, uh, your comment. The the comment I responded to I thought was interesting. Where you, you it was on the uh, Michael Segrew video. And you said that uh, Michael Segru was kind of like the Alan Watts of Western philosophy, and that really uh, piqued my interest because um, I'm a big fan of big fan of both of them. Um, I was wondering what you uh, what your thoughts were on that. So what you'll notice is whenever you're listening to both Alan Watts and Professor Segru, what you'll notice is that they're not actually philosophers themselves. What they are are prolific repositories so to speak, historians of philosophy. And I get the same vibe anytime I'm watching Segru that I get off of watching Alan Watts because he's just so, he, his knowledge base is so abundant and so broad. He doesn't need any notes or anything like that. He just has all of this information on all of these Eastern philosophers and in the case of Segru, all the Western philosophers right off the top of his head. And this is a kind of a superpower that like I'm not privy to, right? Like it takes me time to really delve into, especially people like Kant mm. or like on your latest video you did on Schopenhauer, which I thought was real good. Uh, Schopenhauer is tough, mm. right? And it takes a lot, but you know, Segru has got all these guys right off the top of his head. And I don't know. I just, I feel like he's the only equivalent to Alan Watts on the other end of the spectrum that I've ever come across, especially on YouTube. So. Yeah. I remember I was, I think it was on one of the podcasts that Sigru and his daughter do. He said, uh, if, if you need to take, uh, if you need to have notes with you when you're lecturing, then by definition, you're not prepared. And I was like, Oh, I'm in trouble. But, that reminds me yeah. of something. Uh, I think it was Tolstoy who said it, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to write a novel or do a piece of art and you are not going to contain within it something that is essential to the human condition or to the human psyche, you, you better not even pick up the pencil. Mm. So very same sleeve of stuff. Like he's, he's kind of right, you know, like teaching and lecturing is kind of a, its own art form. And if you aren't proficient at it, I mean, you're going to lose your students like, like that. Yeah, I mean, there was a time I feel like where there was, um, I mean, Tolstoy's uh, definitely one of them, like a philosophical novelist, uh, Dostoevsky, um, but then also like the like the German romantics, like Goethe and stuff like that, which I haven't read much Goethe. Just picking up like like researching, uh, you know, Marx and Hegel and stuff like that. You start to see how like philosophers are hanging out with poets and novelists and musicians like Nietzsche's hanging out with Wagner and it's like this big collective of just intellectuals and, and creative people and um, I don't know do you feel like you still see anything like that today where like there's this drive to you know write stuff but like at the minimum it has to you know like the idea of writing something and it not you know being some kind of universal message about something important that just wasn't what the German romantics were interested in, you know? So no, the last people that I'm aware of that even came close to doing this were Vonnegut, mm -hmm. uh, Hemingway, Ayn Rand. Um, yeah, I mean, it, we've been on a serious uh, substance hiatus as far as, <laughs> <laughs> as far as like novels and stuff are concerned. Now you still get it in like some of your movies and stuff. So you've got like PT Anderson who does movies like, you know, there will be blood, which is okay. seriously about something important. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as novels are concerned, I mean, no, we're, we're on a serious drought and have been for, well, probably since, uh, probably since Ayn Rand died. No kidding. And, and Vonnegut and Hemingway. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like, as I as that question came up, I was trying to think like, you know, if I have any examples, I mean, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe Cormac MacArthur or McCarthy. Um, you know, I just, I actually, I haven't finished it yet, but I just picked up The Road from the library as I watched the movie for like the fifth time. And um, I was actually, actually, Sagru and his daughter did an episode on 
uh, Cormac McCarthy. And so I was kind of thinking like, all right, well, let me try. I've tried reading his books and I always bothered me that he doesn't use, uh, he doesn't let you know who's talking. I don't know, that always annoyed me. It doesn't say like the man said or the boy said or he said, and none of them have names either, which I always thought was like, pretentious but then I started listening to like why he does that and it's actually to kind of like immerse you more in the story which then sure. I kind of a lot of times when I hear an author explain why they do something stylistically then it, I go from not liking it to being like oh this is genius this is the greatest thing ever so I think the first time I ever, the other. I think the first time I ever picked up on that kind of concept was I was reading Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. and throughout the entirety of Lord of the Rings uh, Tolkien is just describing these landscapes and stuff. And I'm like, man, why are you, why are you just explaining this to me in, in so much detail? And then it occurred to me, oh, he's trying to build the world in my head. He's trying to get me to see the crepe myrtles and the flowers and all that good stuff. And yeah, yeah. I, you know, there's another, you mentioned Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky kind of had that problem too. He would sort of jump from speaker to speaker to speaker. And where he was such an intelligent guy, he could not write a character that was dumber than him. So all of his characters sound like geniuses, like even like Grushinka and, you know, like there's no difference between Alyosha and Grushinka and the brothers Karamazov. They're both equally brilliant, which is weird because Grushinka is not a character that's brilliant, but he couldn't help it. And so like jumping from character to character like that, it gets real hard with some of these guys that like, you know, if they're not doing it stylistically, well, then you're kind of in big trouble if you really aren't following along, if you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Yeah, I haven't read uh, Brothers Karamazov. Um, I think really the only thing I read by Dostoevsky was Crime and Punishment right. and Notes from Underground. To my, I took Russian in high school. My Russian teacher recommended Notes from Underground. So both of those are great. Um, Underground's very cynical. Mm-hmm. However, the Brothers Karamazov is his absolute masterpiece. Like, if you have a reading list, I would maybe bump him up a few slots and put that book on there. I have read The no Grand doubt. Inquisitor, though, which that's part of Karamazov, right? Yeah, so that's going to be um, uh, Ivan uh, Karamazov's poem that he wrote that he tells his little brother, Alyosha, who's sort of this uh, initiate at the local monastery to sort of test his faith in his, his God, which there is no testing Alios's faith in his God, but he tries it anyway. And it's a really brilliant piece of uh, literature, but the whole book is brilliant and was actually intended to be a two part series, but he died before he could get it out the uh, second part, unfortunately. So we'll never actually know how the brothers Karamazov was supposed to end, but actually, nonetheless, it's an amazing book. Yeah, that's pretty. Um, yeah, I've been I've definitely been recommended that by by a few people over the years. So maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll we'll bump him up on my reading list. I've heard a pretty insulting uh, piece of commentary on a number of occasions. Uh, the quote being, you're not really an intellectual unless you've read the Brothers Karamazov. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that a couple of times. And I was like, OK, well, I'll go read it because, you know, I want to be an intellectual and stuff. Uh, How long ago did you read that? So I read it uh, four years ago, and I read it twice in one year because it was, it was unbelievable to me. I, I couldn't wow. believe literature like this existed. It's that good. Yeah, but you got to understand, it's not poppy or showy. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a true existentialist drama about real-world stuff, about what especially people in Russia were dealing with back in the 1800s. So, so is there, are there themes in the book that you think are still relevant, like to today? Like, can someone pick that book up and be like, see like analogs to philosophical issues today or? So, yeah, I mean, it's replete with Kantian themes through and through. And if you're a fan of Kant, I would most certainly recommend this book. Now, I'm not that big of a fan of Kant. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean to say that I don't recognize his contributions. Um, but, his, but Dostoevsky being a Christian and contending with Christianity, almost like in a way 
that Nietzsche would describe contending with philosophy, like with as doing so with a hammer. I mean, to be a Christian and to contend with Christianity in the manner that Dostoevsky did is important. It's the kind of thing that like if if there are people about who are religious still to this day, that's the kind of that's the kind of test their faith needs is can you read this book and still at the by the end of it on the last page still call yourself a believer, mm -hmm. which is what I think Dostoevsky believed he actually proved the existence of God with the book. So and I think Tolstoy did with War and Peace as well. Another, uh, yeah, another mammoth sized book I haven't uh, worked through yet, but um, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, the, the, I remember listening to a, um, some kind of video about Dostoevsky's uh, conversion and how it happened after he was, it was, I guess, was it right after he was put through like a mock execution and then he converted, or was it after he got out of the Serbian prison that he was in? Um, something major, majorly bad happens. So and you're, then... you're not, you're following the right uh, train of thought. So what happened was, I think he was always kind of a Christian. Okay. Uh, whenever he was uh, in his 20s, he joined a radical left-wing uh, revolutionary group and was found by the Jar and his henchmen and was sentenced to death. So it wasn't a mox execution. What happened was, is they literally got up to the point of execution, to the point where either the guns or the swords were about to be used. And all of the people uh, that Dostoevsky was gonna be executed with, including himself, were had their sentence commuted at the last second. And okay. I, think, I think it was eight years, eight, five, five or eight years in Siberia and uh, it was that moment that of, of relief whenever his sentence was commuted in which he states that he experienced the most sublime uh, religious spiritual experience of his, of his entire existence that would follow him to wherever he went on the, on the planet for the rest of his days. And probably why he wrote the Brothers Karamazov. I think there were a lot of things, including notes from the underground that were directly inspired by his time in Serbia and uh, yeah, I, I don't think there was a piece of work that he put out that wasn't inspired by that commute. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's interesting to me, this idea of like, um, what, what, what does it take to get someone to convert to something, whether it's Christianity or whatever it is, to be convinced of something. Um, a lot of times, I guess I think a lot about instances where something like that happens and then you're, there's like this relief like oh thank god that didn't happen and that lasts about 20 minutes and then it's back to back to normal and it's always interesting where it's like you know what what is it about someone who's like something internal i think has to uh you know have some kind of shift or something um talking around some issues, I guess, but I'm not sure what your, what your thoughts on that are. So I would say if you're a person who regards himself as a member of the rationalist, rationalist school of thought, um, you're going to need a miracle. You're going to need a miracle. Now I had a buddy a while back who was a Christian or regarded himself as Christian. And this is back whenever I was going through my early uh, transition from religious to atheistic into philosophical and uh, we would have discussions and stuff and uh, one time it clicked in my head because I could never get him to check out what I was wanting him to check out rationally and it clicked in my head one time and I asked him and I said I don't mean this to sound insulting but I think I've finally understood what's going on with you he goes okay hit me I said you do not require evidence to draw conclusions and he said, that's right. No kidding. He looked me in the eye and said, that is correct. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's what's going on with people. People, people, and the thing about it, and this is why I've endeavored to, throughout the next 20 or 30 years, throughout my philosophical career, at one point in time, I want to start a school. At some point in time, I want to start a school. And I want the, the basic curriculum 
of the school to have philosophy as its backbone. Because I don't know about you, but by the time I left high school, I hadn't had a single philosophy course. No. Which mm-hmm. means by the time I was leaving high school, and I regard myself as a pretty smart guy, I had no critical thinking skills outside of mathematics. Mm-hmm. This isn't, an, an, and, and I've, I've put a lot of thought to it. There's no, and this is how it is by and large in the educational system. There is no way that that could have been out of curricula by and large on accident. Mm-hmm. It's not possible. It's too important. It's the backbone of, philosophy is the backbone of every single field of study out there. Before we had science, we had natural philosophy. Period. End of story. And yet, before physics, we had metaphysics, right? And I, I, I regard it as a, a, a shame that most kids are exiting high school without any sort of logics course, any introduction to epistemology or ethics. I find it to be abhorrent. And I think I think people like my friend who are willing to say I don't require evidence to draw my conclusions, I think that's the reason is because they're not trained in philosophy by the time, at least a little bit, right? If you can do algebra, you can do pre-calculus, you can do logic. Mm -hmm. I've done logic. I just took a logic course this past semester. You can do it. If you can do it, if you can do mathematics, you can do logic. And logic teaches you how to think and what to omit from your conclusions and why you should do so. And it's not happening in schools. So I want to change that. But yeah, I, that was pretty long winded. I didn't mean to go off on too big of a no, tangent there. Go for but, it. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that would that would be really cool. Um, yeah, definitely save a spot for me. Um, hey, if if you're willing to, uh, if you love the idea of teaching and are willing to teach some uh, some courses to some snotty nosed <laughs> high schoolers, then sure. Well, that's the thing too. Like, what I mean, I don't know much about the history of like education in the United States or any really anywhere I guess but like I from what I understand um I don't know maybe I'm taking this from a couple summers ago I read a book about um the uh elite boarding schools in the United Kingdom and then ones that I guess were modeled off of them that that are here there's only like you know I don't know a couple dozen or so and they're like you know the most expensive most like you know like the most powerful people, presidents, prime ministers go to those schools, you know, kids that go to the schools, they end up, you know, ruling the world basically. Um, and I definitely feel like I remember some mentions of like, if not philosophy, but like definitely like a, an emphasis on like, you know, maybe you would read like Plato or Socrates, like you would read it as like literature, maybe not specifically as philosophy, but that that would at least be included in the career. I never read anything like that in high school, although there was there was a course in the high school I went to that was offered uh, for like a specific track of students that were like, um, I don't know, gifted and talented kind of thing, um, which I found like interesting is it's like, well, everybody else needs it too, you know, like, and it's like maybe the reason, uh, you know, maybe teaching someone who's not in that, you know, small track of very smart people um, usually smart in like math and things like that, you know, maybe that would, uh, help, you know, but, um, I do remember being annoyed because I wasn't on, I was never good at math or anything like that. So I wasn't part of that, but I remember there was a philosophy course for some of the students, but, um, other than that, I've never read any Plato or anything like that from, you know, even like as, as literature, but I mean, was there, do you know, like there was at some point in time here, like whether that was part of the curriculum generally, or has it always no, been this way? No, I don't, I don't believe it ever has been. I mean, there are going to be places, there are going to be high schools that do offer it. Um, historically, I don't think it's been a part of the curriculum. Now I'll exp- explain this. I, uh, I had sort of a rough upbringing and by the time I graduated high school. I went to seven different high schools. I had been a student at seven different high schools and I wasn't, it wasn't because I was a military kid or anything like Mm -hmm. that. I had a mother who just kept just jumping from state to state to state. Mm -hmm. And um, they never offered any sort of philosophy courses ever that I remember. And I went to a couple of AAA schools that were pretty big, a lot of rich kids, stuff like that. Uh, Never any private schools, but my wife went to a private school and 
she didn't have a philosophy course. So, I mean, I just don't think it, it's kind of like evolution is what I think is kind of going on here. Right. So if, if you want a society of well-trained and calculating and rational people, well, you expose them to philosophy early on. If you don't want that, then you don't expose them. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are probably a million different reasons why the people in power wouldn't want us to be rational and calculating and logical, like to the bone, like what I've grown to be. Um, for the exact same way, or in the exact same way that we don't see evolution in classrooms, right? That's all political, right? And it's been politics that's kept this crucial field of biological study out of schools, right? So I can't really put it past people to be operating under this particular kind of uh, mantra that I'm describing. To do so would be irrational, I think. I think there, I think, by and large. Philosophy is left out of the curric curricula on purpose. Now, but yeah. Um, so, uh, what else we got to talk about? Well, I was actually thinking about. Um, you talked about Tolstoy, um, and you mentioned the, uh, the Schopenhauer video. Um, Wonderful, by the way. I thank like you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate good. it. Um, I always try to give people. There were a couple comments on on the video. Um, I, I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt, um, so because it's always hard when you're reading on a screen. You know, am I you know reading into something too? So I always just give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, that makes me that makes my life easier. Um, I will say this: there was one gentleman who commented on it, uh, sort of. I don't know if he was chastising you, but sort of encouraging you not to uh entertain trolls online uh and for the most part i would agree with him however because of the quality of your response i would say yeah like anytime you can give out like a good 25 minute high quality <laughs> response like that just do it anyway Thank just you. to sort of show them up but <laughs> yeah no i i thought the comment about uh I, I didn't feel like they were chastising me i think they were more being like dude don't stress yourself out too much which i could right. probably use uh, some, you know, uh, you know, cause I will, uh, um, you know, I, I've, uh, yeah, I will, uh, go to one extreme or the other, but, um, but that was kind of how I felt after like doing some research on it was like, oh, this is actually pretty interesting. And it's actually yeah, it's not a great topic. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, and it also got me in, uh, gave me an opportunity to do, uh, you know, a shout out to another channel that's, you know, a little bigger than mine, but still kind of, uh, on the small side, I guess, relatively speaking, and, but I, this, uh, channel Beltgeist, but I feel like he does, uh, like some really good talks on Schopenhauer and, um, it's kind of been disappointing seeing like, you know, some other, well, I don't want to be talking trash, but like, I, I like his, uh, content a lot and I feel like he does a, a really good job and it would be cool to see other people, uh, go over there and check out his stuff. He's done like a bunch of uh, videos on Schopenhauer. And that's what's interesting about Schopenhauer is he's one of those philosophers where you, you can do like Schopenhauer on this, you know, and he, cause he, he covers right. so much stuff. But one of the things I mentioned in the, in the, this uh, latest video was kind of, um, kind of my aim or, or what interested me about Schopenhauer's commentaries on the aesthetics was almost like, I feel like he is, kind of making some mistakes that I've made and mistakes I think a lot of people make when they find something interesting about asceticism that ironically, I think the ascetics themselves are like, no, you're, you're not understanding what this is about. And I remember um, as part of like doing some research on that, I remember looking into Tolstoy because one of the books, well, yeah, I guess the only book that I've read by Tolstoy is um, Kingdom of God is Within You, which was after his own conversion yeah, to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I learned Particularly about... Particularly like, anarchist Christianity. Yes. Yeah. He's a rock and roll Christian. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, you know, uh, like non nonviolent, extreme nonviolence. You know, yes. he was a extremist nonviolence person. Uh, if there is such a thing, extremist pacifism. 
you know well yeah like, i mean yeah i i would yeah i would say he was more of a pacifist whereas people that come from like my side of the sphere are very extreme non-violence people however i regard violence as something if you're going to be giving it to me then you deserve it in response for at least as long as it takes for you to stop giving it to me you see yeah. what i'm saying so in a in ap non-aggression principle yeah i'm one of those guys um but tolstoy was radical non-violent like absolutely not yeah just extremely non non or non-violent which anyway, i feel like if i'm gonna go to one extreme or the other i think i'd rather go to the extreme of pacifism being too pacifist but i guess i guess the definition of extreme kind of means whichever extreme you go to is not good but i my yes. my interest in in that was like i kind of felt like um you know like for myself like kind of just the way i'm wired when i get into something i almost always go to one extreme or the other and then over time usually through meeting people who actually are practicing the things i'm reading and realizing there's a lot more nuance to it and there's a lot more gray areas um whenever it starts to track uh switch from you know intellectual thinking about it to actual like putting stuff into practice and it's like oh this is more complicated than i realized and i kind of i don't know i mean my research on it is limited to just like kind of biographical documentaries about tolstoy's uh conversion but like i kind of felt like same thing like he was very like i mean he was um I guess maybe the word is legalistic in a way, almost like, I mean, to the point where other people were like, dude, you got to like chill out. Chill out you know? yeah. It drove him mad it, by the <laughs> end of his life. I mean, it, he's a bit like Nietzsche, just so brilliant mm. that your brilliance drives you to the point of madness. And if your if your rationality isn't there to bring you back from that madness, it might take your life and it took it took Nietzsche's life and it took Tolstoy's life I mean he literally left he absconded with his daughter in the middle of the night on the last night of his life and in the middle of like winter and mm -hmm. made it made it to a train station he was going to abandon his entire family and he happened to die of some sort of uh, upper respiratory situation that night I mean mm -hmm. just just madness he actually <laughs> I think it was actually in that book. He he mentioned that he regarded all of his uh, previous work, including great stories like War and Peace and Anna Karenina, as worldly trash. And that's very common. And, a lot of times when people go to the almost like a fundamentalist extreme, yes. it's everything that came before is like, well, that's all very worldly and and dirty, and that has to be kept over here, and all the clean holy stuff is over here. And it's always been interesting to me when I read like the writings of particularly the mystics, um, you know, who you would think, I guess, the assumption you hear, see these robe clad people living in temples and you'd think, well, they're definitely following all these rules, which they are. But they also, I feel like, seem to be the most in tune with the idea that there's 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 like a, that not everything is so either or when it comes to the spiritual path, which that was always surprising to me when I would find like someone like Thomas Merton, you know, talking about Buddhism, which is like, well, you're a Catholic monk. That's you're not supposed to do that. But he's basically right. like, I don't care. I like it. So I'm going to do it. That's right. A good way to look at this stuff. And this has helped me so much. It's helped me so much. Is that uh, that gray area, how you determine that gray area is by checking out. So you can take two radically opposing ideologies and find the gray area by simply checking out where they are compatible. And that's it. That's really all you need to know is can I extract from this ideology or from this ep epistemological framework something that is compatible with this? And then you confuse it. It's almost like dialectical materialism in that way. Um, and I've noticed that there's a strange isomorphism between almost all philosophies, right? So you can take Nietzsche and Kant and Hume and Ayn Rand for that matter. And you mm -hmm. can actually, even though they all disagree with one another and some of them vehemently, there's this strange thread that's like, yeah, but all you guys are all trying to find out a way to objective ethics. That's what you're trying to do. Even if Hume just concludes that it's not there, 
that's what he was trying to do, right? That's how, that's how he woke Kant from his intellectual slumber, so to speak. And so Kant wanted to take on that challenge and say, no, 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 you're, you're wrong about your conclusion. Here's how I derive objective ethics. And it's categorical. It's categorical imperative. And that's what Nietzsche is doing, except he concludes this weird master slave morality. And that's the only objective way of looking at it. So there's a strange isomorphism between all of them where it's like, well, I can take little bits of, of Hume. I can take Hume's razor, his guillotine, and I can put that together with, say, the hypothetical imperative, which seems like a totally rational way to derive an objective ethic. And I can pair that with the utilitarian Jeremy Bentham and uh, John Stuart Mill's methodology. That's, that's no mm -hmm. problem at all. And I can I can that with Nietzsche and master-slave morality, at least in a sense of a descriptive sense, right? There's, I, I swear, there's this strange isomorphism between all these things where you can just sort of extract the pieces out of it that do act in a compatible manner with all the others. And that's really how I approach ethics because I'm, I'm, my field is philosophy, but my topic is ethics. Okay. My topical fo focus is ethics. That's how I approach all ethical philosophies. And the same thing goes with Christianity. It's like, sure, can all of these things be compatible with Christianity? It's like, yeah, sure. It can also be compatible with Buddhist, you know, Buddhist methodology. And I can actually pair all those together and become a Kantian, Christian, Nietzschean monk. Mm -hmm. And and nobody's checking this out, I've noticed. Like, everybody's so hardcore. I, you know, I've got a professor right now that regards himself as a rule utilitarian. It's like, okay. well, why would you regard yourself as a rule utilitarian? There's so many different ways to approach ethics, and utilitarianism is sort of a baseline, right? There's so many other compatible methodologies that can go on top of utilitarianism that you don't have to be a rule utilitarianism. Utilitarian, it, I mean, utilitarian. You, you're putting yourself in a pigeonhole, so to speak, an intellectual pigeonhole from which, like, you're safe there. Yeah, you can hang out in the utilitarian sphere you can hang out there all your life but i really wouldn't recommend that because there's just this world of philosophy out here that's so fulfilling that i mean i don't care if you're a marxist or a capitalist there are ways to get you guys together i promise like i promise it but yeah that's my take on the whole gray area thing i pretty much live in the gray area i think the key word you said there was uh was safe like you're safe there i think that's what um uh, I think that's what people are looking for is, and I, and I've said this before, I said this on, uh, someone else's channel that we did kind of similar, similar format, um, where I was talking about kind of my own experiences, how looking for something very rigid and like, do this, don't do that. Don't think about it. You know, um, it is, it promises, uh, some feeling of safety but the reason it doesn't, or at least the reason it didn't work for me was because it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, there's this safety, but on the other hand, the rules are so hard to follow that there's this incredible, like crippling dread of one, that I'm never living up to what I'm supposed to be. And two, nobody else is either. So we're all screwed and there's no hope. And that's just not a good feeling yes. to be walking around with all day. So. so believe it or not, I actually regard this particular topic as one of the biggest contributions, most important contributions that Christianity gave to religiosity as a whole, which is the concept of forgiveness, mm. right? So in Christianity, you have a God who is also the ideal. He's the ideal human being. There's no possible way you can ever attain with this man has attained it's not possible yet you are to live in accordance with his views all the rest of your days this is impossible right the bible sets you up in a situation where you will fail but don't worry you can be forgiven i don't know of other religions that put this in there uh into their zeitgeist so to speak before christianity came along like made it a primacy to forgive, mm -hmm. turn the other cheek, so to speak. Um, I regard that as a, it, and it's, it's, it's applicable to all stringent philosophies or ideologies that regard themselves as puritanical, right? You're never going to live up to the idea of any philosophy. I mean, even 
even people like Marcus Aurelius, as stoic as what he possibly was, there's there's no way you're telling me he was he was so stoic just all his life. Mm. Come on, I mean it's that's irrational, dude. Especially being an emperor with all that power. I mean, get, don't get me wrong, he probably did admirably, and probably did in a way that we can all admire and hope to live up to. But there's just no way he stringently held to it all of his days. It's not possible. And so a lot of your philosophies don't put the whole idea of forgiveness in there. Some, some of them completely tell you to omit the, omit the concept entirely. I'd say Nietzsche didn't give a shit about <laughs> forgiveness, you know, yeah. um, or Schopenhauer for that matter. Um, now, Schopenhauer is somewhat of a mystery to me, though. Uh, I haven't really delved too far into his stuff. I'm not big on nihilist philosophies, and hmm. he seems to be not only nihilistic, but heavily cynical. And, you know, you, you get these people that their first exposure to philosophy is like either Schopenhauer or Stirner hmm. or like Nietzsche or Camus. And it's like, yo, you should probably not do that. You're, hmm. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to hurt yourself. First, first philosopher being uh, Max Stirner, I would say, uh, definitely in trouble. That's, yeah. Uh, or, or maybe not. He is, uh, he's, uh, I mean, he was a troublemaker for Marx and Engels, you know, some of the biggest troublemakers in philosophy. So, yeah. you know, he's trouble. Um, they saw him as a, a major problem to be dealt I with. Think, I think Cap Das Kapital was actually written, or at least a huge portion of it, as a response to Stirner's criticism of Marxism, or at least there was some, maybe some, uh, some essays or something that the two of them did, Marx and Engels, that responded to Stirner's. Earlier, uh, yeah, especially like, like early 1840s, like uh, the Holy Family, um, some, I guess, probably not German ideology, that was more about uh, Bauer and, um, and Feuerbach. Bauer and then thesis on Feuerbach was Feuerbach but yeah the, the the these guys were that's why I love um you know covering uh that thesis on Feuerbach document because it gave me an opportunity to learn about like um just this weird style that these these philosophers in that period of Germany had of like Germany yeah ripping on each other basically like satirizing the way each other like like Bruno Bauer, one of the craziest things he did was he wrote a whole book from the perspective of, it was from the perspective of a Christian criticizing Hegel, and then he was responding on Hegel's behalf, but he was describing Hegel as an antichrist. So it was basically kind of like switching, it was like a switcheroo kind of thing, um, where he's just like, and they just, they imitate each other's styles. Like, you know, Marx does that too, like in uh, the Holy Family and uh, German ideology. Um, I, I never realized how uh, entertaining reading philosophy could be. And, and you got to imagine too, a lot of these guys are hanging out in pubs and getting drunk and arguing with each other. You know, it's, I know it's, imagine it, man. Yeah. <laughs> imagine the days whenever we gathered in in flats and coffee shops and doctors and we we didn't drink ourselves into a stupor listening to rap music we talked about the stuff that mattered man we talked was, about philosophy and science and art man i was thinking back earlier you were saying about um oh actually first you were you were talking about schopenhauer um and uh nihilism and 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 all that um yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a couple talks, I think, on, like, I guess, specifically existential nihilism, because I feel like that's the most um, irritating philosophy to me. I don't think nihilism itself is the problem. I think it's this existential nihilism, which is like, well, there's no meaning to life, but you get to pick your own, which that's, that was my intro to philosophy. That's what I thought all philosophers believed. But then I started thinking, like, well, what what is the actual basis for, you know, thinking that um, it's, I, I've talked about it as like a false dichotomy, like between thinking like, you know, basically the idea is there's no objective meaning to life, but that's okay. You're free and responsible and that's cool. You're, you get to be free and isn't that fun. And I think what annoys me about that is there's this assumption that even if there is an objective meaning to life, 
that doesn't in itself mean someone isn't free. And, and the reason I feel so strongly about that is because mm-hmm. Kierkegaard is probably, you know, one of, if not my favorite philosophers and the situations he places people in and focuses on are people in a world where there is an objective right and wrong thing to do, but they are crippled with anxiety and fear, but mm-hmm. they go through it anyway. It's not a world where they, it, it's their, the way that they, subjectively relate to the objective truth you know is is kept intact and and that's why i always like confused me about this like existential nihilism craze going on where it's like you do realize that you even if there is an objective truth you still have a choice you know whether you're still free a mm -hmm, couple of things there I, i would say for kierkegaard uh love the capacity to love is the proof in the pudding as far as meaning is concerned like, don't even come at Kierkegaard with this whole, there's no meaning to life, right? I have yeah. the capacity to love. That's all the meaning that I need. Not to mention, there's probably a God. I think Kierkegaard was was a Christian, right? Oh, yeah, um, big time. So, I mean, he's, yeah. But on the other side of that, that whole, like, nihilism coin is this. Let's imagine a world that is totally devoid of God, and we've proved it. Does that somehow relinquish you of your duties, your deontological duties to say like your kids or your wife? That seems like something that's meaningful. Or how about to yourself? I feel like if there's no God, then the whole idea of meaning is in the burden of its of its responsibility is placed directly on my shoulders as an individual. I am more responsible for providing my life with meaning and providing my children's lives with meaning and so on and so forth than what i would have been without a, or with a god so either way you flip the coin meaning is still a part of the equation mm. meaning there's meaning and the fact that i as a creature that's come out of the primordial cesspit of evolution can even say the word meaning can even wrestle with the idea of meaning for me proves that well meaning is part of the is part of the equation still now, I'm sort of an atheistic, rationalist kind of guy. Um, I believe that with rationality, that's how I imbue my life with meaning, right? Value seems to, as far as, you know, let's say there is no God. Let's just run with the idea. Um, value comes from the human being, right? Like, I value the cup enough to go buy it. I value having a, you know, purification system to make sure it's clean these sorts of things, like all of that value comes from me, right? Just the way my consciousness comes and is emitted from me or my eyesight. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, like I said before, I, I like Schopenhauer. He's clearly brilliant, clearly more brilliant than I am. However, I just don't regard his conclusions as, as uh, salient or as coherent. I mean, you could probably find a way to coherently put them all together and, and just conclude, yep, uh, there's no meaning and the world is uh, predominantly characterized by suffering and we're all just going to suffer and die. It's like, okay, go live with that, dude. Go see where that gets you. Go see where that gets the people that hang around you. Well, I think that's like Schopenhauer and, and Kierkegaard too uh, um, it are great examples of philosophers who knowing a little bit about their biography and then you read their philosophy and it's like, Okay, yeah, this makes sense that they would think that. You know, <laughs> sure, yeah. um, Kierkegaard in particular, um, you know, as as you know, Sugru put in like the first episode of that podcast that I listened to. The first thing I heard was, "Was Kierkegaard guy is effing crazy?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, he is. That is, but Sugru likes him, even though he's he's crazy." But um, the thing with Kierkegaard is like, um, I read that I can't remember the name of the the lecture but these were part of the Gifford lectures series um I don't know what college that is if it's Harvard or something it's one of those like Ivy League school things I think um and he was talking about Kierkegaard and faith and reason all these topics and he said that um he said that Kierkegaard's picture of God was pretty much a mirror of his temperament as a person you know he was very gloomy very moody and so of course his you know um 
his picture of God was very kind of rigid, kind of, you know, uh, I forget exactly the words that the guy uses, um, but it was, it kind of opens up my mind to this idea that, um, you know, a, you know, supposing, you know, whether or not there is a God, that's something we're always going to be wondering in philosophy, but supposing there is, I guess my issue is like, even if there is, that doesn't mean that people don't individually have different subjective uh, ideas about it. You know, um, yes. I think, I think a lot of times it's, you know, it's kind of inverted where it's like, well, there's all these different ideas about religions and gods. So therefore none of them must be true. And it's like, well, maybe these are just, you know, kind of a, you know, the three blind men and the elephant kind of situation. Maybe this is just all the different ways that people with limited perceptions, meaning all of us, you know, we can't perceive something that's beyond perception. Um, maybe this is the way we all individually kind of make sense of it. Um, you know, and I think that's why I, I just started doing a, a series on the, on the Bhagavad Gita. And I think that's what attracted me, maybe one of the most things that attracted me to, um, to Hinduism was there's this running theme throughout Hinduism and especially like teachers like Swami Vivekananda and uh, Yogananda, just this kind of assumption, like it's just not even a controversy, this idea that like, of course, people are going to be following different paths. That's just not, it doesn't create this tension um, for, you know, uh, in, because within like the Hindu system, this idea of everyone kind of following a path that, that, that they're kind of tailor fit to follow, like, that that's okay and that it's actually ideal to follow the path that you find is best suited for you so this idea that like there's all these different paths therefore none of them lead anywhere sure, to me yeah. was always like a it doesn't mean that they do lead anywhere maybe they don't that's also possible but just to write it off that quickly um which then we're getting into like relativism and stuff which also irritates me well and determinism yeah. too i mean mm -hmm. what you're talking about what you're describing is I think falls under the compatibilist view. It's like, sure, you have biological determinants, right? Like you didn't choose your dad. You don't choose how big your brain is or how tall you are or anything, but that doesn't mean your path isn't your path. Mm -hmm. That it isn't exclusively owned by you and in a way that accommodates some manner of freedom. So falling back on Tolstoy, Tolstoy believed that the only way to have free will and freedom was to be able to uh, exists within a framework that had limitations. So like you can't run as fast as what you do, like say in a race without gravity, you can't do it. It's not possible, right? You can't value clean drinking water without uh, the biological mechanisms that allow for you to integrate water into your bloodstream and deliver it to the places it needs to go, mm -hmm. right? So like you can't actually be you and be free to be you without the constraints that define your reality. It's a very kind of cool concept, right? And back then it was kind of groundbreaking. Like nobody had really come up with these ideas before. It's like, oh, the constraints actually create the freedom. Yes, yeah. I That's that's something that I think is often missed. Um, it's one thing that I, I remember talking about in a I, on an essay I wrote in, in school about, um, uh, we were either, I think we were either doing Aristotle or Kant. I can't remember. Um, I think it was Kant. Um, and I was talking about like, basically, like you just put it like succinctly, like the, the constraints actually allow for some freedom. Like that's, I like that. I think um, like, for example, like this idea of following uh, your duty or something, you know, if, like the idea of having a duty, that's definitely, you know, squarely within the Kantian you know, deontology. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's this idea of like, oh, I don't want to have a duty that's so restrictive. And it's like, I've, I've, have you ever tried it? You know, sure. I've, I've, cause I've tried having no purpose and it's not very satisfying. You no, know? it's, it's horrifying Yeah, because you are a purposeful being. You're, you're evolved to do things purposefully and you have the prefrontal cortex, which has been evolved to make sure that you do that. And that's how you survive, right? It's why people integrate their beliefs so deeply into their psyche, psyche that they're willing to fight and, and die for. That's not by accident. That's evolutionary psychology. 
Um, but when it comes to the, the constraint things, it's like, you know, or the, the deontology thing, it's like, there's nothing wrong with having a duty. But let's say I love my wife because it's my duty. What value is there, is there in that? Right? Mm-hmm. I want my wife to know I love her regardless of my duty. And so I, I relinquish it, it. It's, it's about finding the gray area in the duty aspect. It's like, look, if you've signed a, a rental agreement, it's your duty to pay that rent. But like, I have no duty to love my wife. And the fact that I love her without that duty is what Im- imbues that choice with all of the spices and, and, and value that it has. So it's, it's a, again, back to the gray area thing. It's like, you have to be able to pick and choose where things are compatible with one another. Duty is not compatible with love because once it becomes a duty to love, love thy neighbor, it is no longer love that you're giving to them. It's something else. It's a duty, right? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a cool topic. Actually. Sorry, did you have to go? No, no, I was saying it's a cool topic. Kierkegaard, I, it's actually the first book I ever read by Kierkegaard was a book called Works of Love, which is one of his love, more, yeah. Uh, yeah, his upholding Popular, discourses. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting how he he's basically like, you know, it he breaks down like, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself, breaking it down like each word, you know, throughout the whole book. And basically his thesis is like the opposite, where it's like, and I don't remember exactly what his how he arrives at the conclusion but basically it's like it is your like how can love be a duty and um you know he thinks that it uh it can be i don't remember exactly what his argument for that was but when i think of kierkegaard and and um you know uh the idea of love like i mean it's hard to kierkegaard is one of those philosophers where like his biography is so intertwine with his philosophy once you know about it because then you start seeing so much of his work as like oh this is just a guy who's really having a hard time and he is uh talking to himself basically you know in a way some I know some people look at fear and trembling as really an allegory for him and uh Regina Olsen you know the woman that he mysteriously you know decided not to marry even though he loved her and Nobody really know. I guess his, I guess the main idea is that he felt like kind of like Tolstoy, I guess, maybe felt like he couldn't be a philosopher and marry this, this young lady um, who gave him that idea. That's kind of the thing that interests me is like, you know, cause I, I think I see, I see so much. There's a part of me that has that mentality that thinks in these very either or terms. And so there was a period in my life where I looked to writers like that as kind of like validated that mentality now through you know various you know just growing up and maturing kind of finding the the gray areas like we were talking about I still appreciate those writers precisely for the fact that it's kind of like going back and looking at you know this kind of my shadow self I guess you could say and my shadow self is very uh very obsessive compulsive and rigid in its thinking but when you were talking about Tolstoy and um, um, when he kind of left, you know, to go on the that final train ride, um, I don't know if he made it to the train or if he just made it to the station, but you were talking about how he and Nietzsche kind of met the same end. And I think you mentioned something like where if you don't have like your rationality to pull you back. And I was wondering, like, I, I maybe I see him maybe a little differently maybe we could look at that like i almost look at it like that's the consequence of being too rationalistic because sure I mean, the way that like someone arrives at a conclusion like okay this book is telling me this so i have to take it literally and literally do that you know that's where you have people that read the part about you know pluck out your own eye and cut off your own hands in the bible and it's like well they don't mean literally do it right but some people there have been sects that do things like that and I so feel like I, I, w- I would say that it's an illusion okay so back to Dostoevsky he actually covered this in Crime and Punishment right his whole thesis in Crime and Punishment was something along the lines of you can 
chase the rationality bunny into the rabbit hole of rationality so far and so deep that you're actually willing to set yourself in your own mind on the same platform as Napoleon Bonaparte, right? Mm -hmm. What did Napoleon Bonaparte do? He attempted to dominate the entire uh, Western world and probably had plans to go beyond that, like he did in Egypt and stuff. Um, and he gives you, Dostoevsky gives you the character of Raskolnikov who ends up uh, convincing himself that he's this Napoleon-esque figure because he's just so rational, so rational, isn't he? Um, and he kills somebody. And then he realizes that, well, there are certain biological responses uh, that seem to be a part of our intrinsic nature that don't let him be the Napoleon he wants to be. Now, keep in mind, the reason why I said that this is kind of an illusion is, is what did Dostoevsky use to give you this story? He used his reason. Right. I don't I don't know of the people who simply went crazy with reason and mm -hmm. died. I know the people who were obsessed with religion like Nietzsche and Tolstoy who went crazy. I've never known of I mean, it, maybe you do, but I don't know of any great thinker who was just so rational that he lost his mind. I think there's a certain madness that if you if you don't rein your brain in with your rationality uh, that you can get lost to. And Nietzsche did that, and so did Tolstoy. Now, it's kind of funny because Nietzsche was a, an atheist, mm -hmm. but he was an obsessive atheist. He was so obsessed with being, he called himself the Antichrist, <laughs> yeah. which is funny because whenever you were talking about Bauer earlier, I was thinking, you know, it would have been really funny if he had written that satire about Nietzsche instead, because it was more applicable. Bauer was now, actually a uh, mentor of young Nietzsche at one point. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have been real funny if, uh, yeah, if he'd written that satire about Nietzsche because it would have fit perfectly. Mm. Um, but he was obsessed with religion. He was fucking obsessed with it. It drove him mad. So I don't know if it's religion doing it to people, but I, th I, think, it's, I think it's something along the lines of what Dostoevsky was kind of getting at in what I think was a, uh, a better novel, uh, Demons. Did you ever, mm -hmm. you haven't read Demons? I've heard of it and I haven't read it yet. So the whole book was about ideological possession. Mm. Um, and Zizek. it ends. Zizek? Oh, you mean. Uh, <laughs> Ideology. Yeah. Um, damn, what's his name? Zizek? Slavoj Zizek. Slavoj, yeah, Slavoj Zizek. Cool guy, a little too spacey. I bet his. <laughs> I bet his written work is way better because like he is just not a public speaker. However, he is hilarious whenever he does public speaking. I think he's hilarious. I just started going through his first book and that was one of the first things I said in the, in the first talk I did was like how surprised I was at how lucid the writing is. I was like, wow, I can actually understand this, you know, sort of. Really, sort really of. people are like that. It's kind of like Einstein and his damn desk, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, you're, these people, brilliant people like Slavoj, I, they're, they're better when they're sitting behind a desk with no one around so that they're not constantly bouncing off of, you know, the vibes that they're getting from other people because, like, he just can't handle public speaking. Yeah, he seems very nervous when, uh, when he's talking, I'm assuming. Because when he's on camera, he do, when he's uh, in, his, in his movie, like, he, he doesn't seem to have as many, like, the nervous tics. He has some of them, but it's not as bad as when he's, yeah, as when he's in front of other people. So I'm assuming that's, like, a just a nervous habit he has when he's in front of large crowds yeah which i always so. i like i like seeing someone like that that he, even though they have that they don't let that get in the way of uh going authenticity on. Yeah. is a big thing mm -hmm. it, it, it really is we're seeing so little of it in the world right now that mm -hmm. people like slavoy are really calling out to young to young intellectuals of, of the modern it's, it's why it, jordan peterson is doing the same because the guy just presents himself and he just doesn't give a shit what you think about him. He's just going to get out there and say exactly what he feels he ought to say. Actually, did you catch that uh, debate between him and Zizek? I've seen I've seen bits of it. I found the audience rather annoying for most of the, the video, the, the cheering and jeering. I'm like, can can these two guys just be in a room together, you right. know, without this audience? But I, I have seen parts of it. my favorite part is where Zizek tells Peterson that he's not a Marxist. He's a Hegelian. 
And then it turns into basically Peterson in, uh, I think I saw one commenter make this observation that it basically was like watching Peterson in class almost, but I, I didn't really see it as like one of them won. I thought it was one of the best debates of that nature I ever saw because it looked like it was two people who came in and at some moment there was this realization. You can see it in their demeanor. You know, both of them are, have a very pronounced stage presence. So you can really see their body language. There's this moment, I don't know exactly where it was, but where they both seem to realize like, there's a I don't gray think area I, here. Yeah, yeah, almost yeah. like I've been misunderstanding what they're saying and they've been misunderstanding me. Why don't we just start over? And it's that was uh, very interesting to see. You don't see that with Chomsky and Foucault so much, something like that. But, you know, that's kind of uh, just, you know, Foucault trying you know where, to dominate, you know. You know Chomsky. where Chomsky lost me? Where? I used, love, I used to love Chomsky. I thought he was a great intellectual. He lost me whenever he tried to claim that Lenin was a right winger. Okay. Yeah. See, I'm not too bit. I'm not too familiar with like the different political stuff. Like a anything with Marx after Marx, I don't really know too much about. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm. A, I'm not. I mean, just from what I understand about what the term left and right mean generally, that seems kind of strange. At this point, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't think it means anything anymore. I don't abide them. Yeah. I. D I don't. Yeah. I've, I've had people call me a right winger and I'm like, dude, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. I don't know what you mean. And I doubt that you, I doubt that you. Do too. <laughs> yeah. But. I took a political uh, philosophy class last semester, hoping it would uh, clear things up and all it just, it really just confirmed that there are so many gray areas. I remember having a conversation with my professor saying like, look, I've been reading uh, a lot of Marx's early writings when he was more, had more of a humanist bend to him, admittedly that kind of, you know, evaporated a little bit later, but, you know, his earlier writings I'm reading, and then we're reading about uh, Edmund Burke, you know, a conservative, and I'm like, I'm seeing some similarities, like, not everything, there's some certain weird things that this guy's saying that I see in Marx, I'm, am I going to fail this class because of this, and he's like, no, no, that's just, that just makes sense, you know, it's all that's just funny. a big mess, everybody's kind of you know, congeals together. Again, you know? I bring it back to that, that strange isomorphism that I, I swear I seem to be the only one noticing, right? It's kind of like with the, when it comes to Marx and the division of labor, it's like, well, where did he get that idea? You got it from Adam Smith. Well, aren't Adam Smith and Marx supposed to be totally ideologically opposed? It's like, well, no, it's just, he's, he's, Marx was taking what he believed to be compatible with his views from Adam Smith and applying it to his own methodology and that's that's your gray area it's like mm -hmm. but the gray area always exists it doesn't matter where you go or what philosophy that you adopt right so it's like take objectivism objectivism is in many ways compatible with subjectivism i don't care what anybody thinks about that i guarantee you i can extract some ideas that well how's about this if you're an individual and you believe in rationality there you go there's your already you're being subjective there's an element of subjectivism right in there because you are an atomized individual away from the rest of everybody. So your subjective predilections are leading you to the conclusion that you should be as rational as possible at all times and place your happiness as paramount. And that's exactly what the Epicureans believe too. It's like, wait, so there's this, again, there's this strange isomorphism going all the way from the top, all the way down when it comes to these philosophers. And so again, what I do is I just, I just extract what's valuable from each of them. Right. So you're talking about uh, Ayn Rand objectivism or. Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay. It's been a, been a long time since I read, uh, I think I read Anthem in middle school, not for school, but just for fun. But um, that was interesting. But uh, yeah, I'm not too familiar with her stuff. Oh, I'd recommend it. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I mean, it definitely got me interested in uh, in the Brothers Karamazov. Um, sometimes that's all I need is to hear somebody like explain why why it matters. I mean, that's that's how I got into the Gita. I would pick open this this book, and it's like talking about this battle taking place, and I'm like, I don't understand what the relevance is. And then I finally had someone explain, like, no, the battle is a metaphor. You know, the battle is your life, dude. And then it's like, oh, okay. Now, now this is like the greatest thing ever. 
it but it's also a theomachy yeah. too. It's also a theomachy because it's a, uh, I can't remember the, the names in uh, the Mahabharata as mm-hmm. like by and large. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> I know. It's like the longest book ever written. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but the, but, but the Gita is, is basically, it's not just a, a the, uh, like a metaphorical battle between you and the world. It's a, it's a battle between you and the gods, which was really cool because like back in the day, you know, the Greeks regarded themselves as the playthings of the gods. Whereas the Bhagavad Gita presents you with the idea of, no, 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 I can contend with the gods. Very cool idea. Very cool idea. A um, little bit of that's in the Bible as well. Contending with God, wrestling with God. Yeah. Jacob um, wrestling. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool concepts whenever you think about how old they are. Mm-hmm. I was just listening to uh, some Sagru yesterday while I was doing uh Did you have to shovel any snow? today or or yesterday or no i'm in charlotte so it's although kind of cold it's uh sunny out and pleasant got got a few inches of snow it was kind of uh relieving i'm like it's january I'm like come on like let's let's have some snow already but i was listening <laughs> yeah. to uh some sagru talk about uh uh the greeks and uh, prometheus and how uh there was this running theme where they wanted they they looked at prometheus as like the you know the big hero of the greeks of like you know the guy who you know screwed over the gods or or tried to anyway and stole um, their fire right mm-hmm. yeah yeah and then he was contrasting that with job you know the dutiful servant of god who you know you know can uh can be blasted with uh boils and leprosy but won't won't say anything bad about god no matter what so he's kind of i always thought you know as i moved to a more philosophical mind frame so to speak uh predisposition i reread job not too long ago and i thought this is (laughs) disgusting this is gross i can't believe god would murder his whole family what in the world just to promise him don't worry we'll get you a new one just to win a bet with satan yeah right um what did they bet? I always wondered that, like money or <laughs> they never clear that up exactly. Yeah, for real. Like, what are we getting out of this? It's like, well, you're telling me Job's going to totally cave. And I'm like, well, no, he's not. I'll bet you. What am I betting you? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Let's just do it. NFTs, maybe. NFTs. Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, I don't know how much time you have left. I um, we didn't talk much about Alan Watts. I don't know if you had any uh, favorite talks about him. One thing you you had mentioned that stuck out to me was I know there's one lecture that Watts gave called "You Can Never Live Like Christ." You know where you were talking about kind of this ideal human that you can never live up to. Um, but you know, I feel like I mean we in a way we have been talking about alan watts because that gray area is where he lives right that's right he he walks the path of the joker Mm -hmm. the middle way so to speak Mm -hmm. um my thing with alan watts is he's so brilliant man but see i'm at sort of face value an egoist and he and he would hate that about me and the thing about it is is the more that i've listened to alan watts on the concept of the ego the more of an egoist i've become because what he seems to be misconstruing and he He's actually mentioned it a couple of times in his in his uh, lectures and just never made the connection is that what he's talking about when it comes to regarding the ego as not a thing. uh, It's definitely not a thing that needs to be heeded is not actually relinquishing the ego, but be but becoming secure and concrete with it. So in the Jungian sense, integrating the shadow. And I don't think he ever made that connection. I don't think he ever made the connection that he was actually becoming closer with his ego than what he what he believes was going on. He believes he was demolishing his ego, and I just don't think that's what the case was. But I love his commentary on the subject, especially the uh, the idea of the uh, the professor asking his student, uh, you know, or the student coming to his professor professor and being like, "I don't want to desire." And the professor saying, um, well, this is what you're going to do. You're going to attempt not to desire. And the student goes away and attempts not to desire, but finds that he's desiring not to 
attempt to not desire. Mm -hmm. And what that what that really sort of explicates is the idea that there's, there's kind of like a triune part of you, right? Like there's the guy that notices something. Then there's the part of you that notices that you notice it. Then there's the part of, part of you that noticed that you just did that. So there's this like threefold you. And uh, Alan Watts just does an amazing job expressing that to his audience. Like it's just, it's very, very, very good. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's about, that's my favorite stuff from Alan Watts. That's the stuff that sort of opened me up, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was thinking. You, you, you said it, but that's what I was thinking with the, the whole getting rid of your ego thing um, is uh, the ego is the thing that wants to get rid of it. Cause it's like, I don't want to just get rid of my ego. I want to get like, you know, a certificate, you know, like you get when you vote, like I voted, I got rid of my ego, you know, yes, that's <laughs> but right. then that's the ego doing that still. Exactly. It, it's, it'd be like saying, I want to get rid of my consciousness. It's not possible. Yeah. It's not possible. What, what you want to do is integrate the things. With, it's like what Jung said. Either you make the, the unconscious conscious or it will forever dominate your destiny and you will simply call it fate. Mm. Right. The more that you can bring up that 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 sub subterranean you behind your false ego, the more you can integrate it with your ego and become a well-rounded individual who in the sort of uh, uh, his name's leaving my mind now maybe i'll remember it in, in, in a little bit but uh so the sublimated you mm -hmm. right the uh actualized self-actualized you that's what i think he was um keen that i don't think he made the connection to even though he was so brilliant and could have certainly made the connection self-actualized sounds uh maybe like maslow maybe abraham maslow no, I'm not thinking Maslow. There was a uh, there was a gentleman, Man's Search for Meaning. Who wrote that? Oh, Frankel. Frankel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So Frankel believed that it, uh, uh, chasing sublimation and self actualization was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Self actualization was going to fall into your lap, like you'll do it one way or another. And as you grow and you and you and you mature. You, what you'll notice is that, well, it is kind of happening to you, but it's happening naturally. But he didn't make any room for the idea of the rational agent attempting to make it happen quicker, right? So you get all these people. So you get these, you get these guys that are like 50 that start going through like their you know, sort of like middle age crisis and stuff. It's like, well, because they never, they never self-actualized, right? And so what they're going to have to do is do that way later in their development. Whereas people like me started getting into philosophy and rationality and the rationalist schools, and I started doing that five years ago, right? So I'm going to be, by the time I'm 50, way past that stage of development. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I did a couple of talks on uh, Man's Search for Meaning, hoping to do some more. Frankel's been uh, kind of uh, someone who keeps popping up into my life uh, every few years. Um, I mean, he's like one of my favorite writers, you know, because like Amazing. his, I mean, his, it's really hard to beat his experience. It's really hard to say, uh, you know, I mean, when he says something that is born out of the experience he went through, it's kind of like, well, you know, it's kind of hard to argue, you know, it's, it's like to, you know, it's it, abstractly, it's easy to say things like, uh, to say, to talk about things like, you know, uh, meaning and, you know, life has no meaning or something like that. And I mean, we all go through that, that stuff. I mean, uh, and people have been going through that for a long time, but he finding out what he thought about meaning through being in the concentration camps is like, I think just adds to the, you know, the emotional resonance of it too. And yes, but, you said that right. Camps. Yeah plural mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah two i think he was in two of the worst ones i know he was in auschwitz but like just that alone like his chances yeah. of survival were like almost zero you know and yeah. so now that we're on this topic i'll tell you what really uh what started me on this path mm -hmm. um I, my wife picked up a book from the library one time called the last jew of treblinka 
by okay. Jill Regman. And now there were only a handful of survivors from Treblinka. And in one year, 900,000 people were put to the sword at Treblinka. And one of them made it out to tell the tale in writ. And two of them, Samuel Willenberg and Kalman Teigman, also made it out. And they, by the way, I turned the last page of that book and wept like a child. It was, it was that intense. Like what these guys went through it, at Treblinka, just Treblinka alone, is unreal it's unacceptable the idea that this is a part of our history is makes people like schopenhauer seem like they're on to something hmm. and nietzsche for that matter um but i read that book and wept like a child and realized i had to uh i had to figure out what the hell was going on here like meaning wise and that's actually what catapulted me into philosophy um but what you'll notice is and i highly recommend this book it's not for the faint of heart though um if you're one of those guys um, which I don't think you are, but um, Frankel, Teigman, Willenberg, and Rakeman all seem to have generally the same outlook on life. Mm. And I found that to be strange. It's ne it, none of them expounded on it quite like uh, Frankel did, but you can just kind of see it in their commentary that like they had to adopt that stoicism in the face of adversity to maintain any sort of semblance of meaning in their life and like they did it and lived through it and were generally happy towards the end of their lives as far as i could tell um very interesting topic like mm. what some of those guys went through yeah very sobering for sure mm -hmm. i kind of was introduced to man's search through meaning through uh through therapy and after kind of reading it, it was like you know, it was such a counterpart to my default mindset. Right. You know? Oh, that puts things into perspective. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just remember going through some crazy uh, situations, 90% of my own making, maybe 100% of my own making, I guess. Um, and well, the just, Stoke would say yeah. it's 100% you. Oh, yeah. And, and it's your responsibility to accept that. And it's not something you have to be hard up about. Yeah. Actually, it's something you can celebrate. Just integrate that shit and move forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely. Yeah, I don't know, just this whole thing about like we have one thing that you can't take away from somebody and that's their ability to choose. And it's like that's you can intellectually try and argue with that, but try and actually put the opposite of that into practice. Try and convince yourself really. I mean, you really have to put in work to convince yourself that you don't have a choice and it becomes a habit. I mean, that's what it was like for me being when I was younger was like, you know, I felt like, well, I can't do anything. I just, you know, uh, I, I don't have a choice. And now it's like I'd have to exert mental effort to convince myself. And sometimes I'll put in the effort because I don't want to yes. do something, you know, but it always it never feels good. It never feels it's, it's harder one, but it's worth it to feel that sense of like, you know, yeah, this situation sucks. And this is not the situation that should be happening. This is wrong. It's not fair. It's not right. And it could be better. There's no, there's just, there's no reason it shouldn't be better. It should just not be happening, but it is. What do I want to do about it? Like, I don't know. I just don't know if I would have survived as long as I had if that hadn't changed at some point. And Frankel had a big part in that of really instilling that, you know, it was kind of like down to my marrow kind of belief, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you live in a determin deterministic world, well, what business do you have making any choices or convincing yourself of the illusion of choice? It's like, and that's a recipe for disaster if you abide by that stringently. Mm -hmm. But what's not a recipe for disaster is abiding by the idea that, well, actually, as far as I can tell, the only force of nature that's going to make this situation any better happens to appear to be, at least, me. That's a better way of looking at things, but it comes with its own responsibility. It means that you have the responsibility to make it better. And a lot of people don't like the idea of that because think about it. I mean, how long does it take for you to complete a degree? Right? It's four years. 
And who's to say after you get finished with that degree, you're going to have a good job. There's all kinds of skills out there in the labor market that have nothing to do with degrees. Right. I'm a business to business tech sales guy. And I'm not doing anything with my philosophy training so far. Right. But to self-actualize in a way that actually makes your situation better takes time, effort, dedication, and in many times, many ways, sacrifice. Most people don't like the idea of that, that thought like, oh, I could make it better, but all the time, the effort that's going to have to go into it's like, especially whenever you're young and you're already kind of like lethargic and weary and jaded about the world. It's like the idea that you can just get up and start, you know, bootstrapping your way to success is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And so you, I, you swallow that pill, you take that tablet. That's like, Oh, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And most people do that in the literal sense. Yeah. They straight up. I mean, like we've had 900,000 ODs this past year. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. It's never happened before. Yeah, every it's, every it's year epidemic. it's going up in the hundreds of thousands. That's more people than would have ever died more. Mm -hmm. Not ever, not throughout the entirety of history, but yeah. as far as American history is concerned, I mean, every year we're losing war numbers of people, you know, battle of the Somme kind of numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's because they're swallowing that damn pill, not just literally, but figuratively as well. Oh, there's nothing I can do. I can't do anything to change my situation. It's just not the way you ought to be thinking. Not at all times. I mean, sometimes like, look, like if you look, if you get paralyzed and you're in the hospital, it's like, oh, well, there's really nothing I could do now. It's like, sure. Okay. Take that pill. I'm not going to hurt, beat you up about it. It's like you're in a real situation, but the idea that you've got your, all of your rational faculties, all working limbs, the idea that you can't do anything is absurd. Look, man, Elon Musk built a car and sent it out into space. You can do something. You can do something. But yeah, Frankel, Frankel really helps with that, that kind of mentality. You know, like, I think the hard just, thing too for people is it's not, it, you want it to be a plan. Like, I want to know what's going to happen when I put in this input and put in this action and this, like, it's data into a computer and then the correct results or the desired result will pop out at the end. And it's like, yeah, I, I mean, you can spend time doing that and build, it's hard to not have certain expectations just as long as I, uh, you know, kind of detach from them a little bit, you know, like, and, you know, I, I have, I mean, when I put my first YouTube video up last year, I didn't know that a year later, I'd be having a conversation with another philosophy student talking about all these things that wasn't I didn't plan that a year ago and I have to remind myself that and maybe it sounds like obvious like duh like you can't predict the future but on some level I must have thought that I should have been able to predict the future when I was you know a teenager like because how am I gonna like what what am I gonna do do something and then fail no right. you know <laughs> I only want to do something if I know it's gonna uh, work, you know, and work in a specific and way. You know, with that, there's there's two things I have to say about that. Um, uh, first thing is, is there is one definitive way you can always predict the future when it comes to the inputs and outputs. Garbage in, garbage out. Right, always. I don't care. I don't care what situation. I don't care if you want to be a philosopher or a biologist. You put in garbage work, you will get garbage output. Period. Now, as far as failure is concerned, and I actually had a friend a while back uh, that was just so afraid of it, failure. Uh, he, people don't seem to understand that there's actually value in failure, right? Like yeah. if you actually attempt your, your best at something and you fail, then you get a real crystal clear image of what it is that you did, right? Like if you honestly put in as much effort as you could possibly put in to something and you get garbage in response, then you have a clear image of what it is that was garbage and what it is that wasn't. So there's value in failure. Like I have never gotten an F on a paper because I always put in as much effort as I can and I do all the citations right and my arguments are generally salient. But I have failed classes, mm -hmm. right? And it's because I wasn't putting in that effort. And that feeling that I got from failure didn't incentivize more failure. It incentivized yeah. more success, right? So there's value in failure that people just don't seem to be 
checking out. I think it's, again, I think it falls back to what we were originally talking about, about philosophy being absence from schools. People are not given proper, proper explication on this stuff, man. And I'm not saying philosophy can do that for you in just a couple of years or something, but I mean, it really can if you're focused on what it is that the great philosophers of the world were trying to convey to you. So I don't know. Yeah, that's my two things on that. I think one of the best experiences I've had in school happened a few, maybe three years ago um, when I was still at my uh, community college and I was doing uh, public speaking. It was like the last class I needed before I could switch to a four-year school. And the teacher was very difficult, very difficult to, to pass the class, very, you know, uh, because I was taking the class online, there was a little bit more involved in gathering an audience and filming and um, something happened on one of my assignments where when I sent in the file to him, it was, there was something wrong with the file and he gave me a zero. It wasn't something so major that like, it was basically like a one second glitch. And he said, it looks like you tried to edit two pieces together, which you weren't allowed to do. Um, and so I got a zero on it. And I was like, I, my, I was like insane. Like, I was like, I can't fail this class, but I don't know how I'm going to like retake. He gave me the opportunity to retake the assignment, but I was just so dreading it because it was so much work to put in um, getting eight, getting eight to 10 adults in one room together you know, who work and have lives was not easy. But after that experience, which was like, and public speaking was not something I liked doing. You know, now I'm a little bit more comfortable with it because I'm doing it on camera a lot more, but it's not something I ever enjoyed doing um, before. And it ended up being probably maybe the most, one of the most important experiences I had in, in school because it, First of all, it raised my threshold for what I can tolerate in terms of stress, because throughout this whole process, I didn't even allow myself really to entertain any negative thoughts. I just was like, you don't have the luxury to think yeah. negatively right now. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was it allowed me to, it showed me how to like make the best of a shitty situation. Because what I ended up doing was getting in touch with someone else in the department for help on the project and, and she ended up helping me a lot with it which was really um really helpful and but it, it wasn't like an ideal situation you know I would have rather that I didn't have to retake it but I had to so but it ended up being a, a really invaluable experience and also what I learned from taking the class I actually get to use today in terms of like how to set up a presentation you know how to yeah. present ideas in a logical step-by-step -step process you know I took from from that class so it's uh you know definitely something I'm grateful for even though at the time I felt like I was having a heart attack you know so that just kind of like for me is like there's so many things that I've gone through in the last few years in school that like if I hadn't gone through that I wouldn't be able to handle, but now it's just like, it's just gravy. Cause it's like, Oh, this is nothing. You know, right. remember yeah. last time, you know, this is nothing, you know? Yeah. It's like your brain tells you, but remember all you have to do is do it. Mm -hmm. It's like, right. Cause like, you know, you, you failed the one assignment because you put in a little bit too much garbage into it. Right. Mm -hmm. In some way or another, it's like, Oh, well the, the price I pay for putting in garbage is like overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm not going to put in garbage now. And I ain't saying that like every situation that you ever encounter in your life, you're going to be mindful enough to incorporate this concept into, right. But people like Frankel would say, no, no. He'd say, why haven't you killed yourself yet? Right. Whatever it is that has kept you from killing yourself. If your situation is so dire, whatever it is that has, that has kept you from killing yourself, that's what you need to regard as your meaning. And you need to understand that you can get yourself out of the situation. And he would mean it, you know, it's a, it's kind of a tough, tough pill to swallow though, for some people again, because, you know, once it's rationally understood by the mind that you do have a place in the situation, regardless of how dire your straits are, there's a certain sense of responsibility that comes along with it. And I'm telling you, man, people, especially modern day people do not like 
responsibility, especially if it's mm. arbitrarily foisted upon them. And I understand that too. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't like the idea of anybody telling me that I have a duty. It's like, no, I'll let you know what my duties are. But, you know, sometimes life comes by and says, oh, hey, buddy, it's your duty. It's like, oh, well, got to get to it. Well, so Franklin think. says we're answering to life. Life presents these questions to us, which I always, I always like the way he puts that. Yeah, there's a biological imperative to action, right? Like you, you, you have to get enough rest. You have to get enough sleep. You have to get enough food and water. It's like there are biological, natural calls to action. Um, that it, it seems to signify that there's, to me, objective measures by which more like objective standards by which we can derive ethics, right? Because if ethics is encompassed, if all, eth if, if the term ethics encompasses all behaviors, right? And all behaviors are objective. And on some level, those behaviors are biologically imperative because you as a biological creature are an objective creature with objective hardware. Then it appears to me that we can actually derive objectively ethics from reality. And I don't mean... Mm. all the time all the time i don't think that's the case i mean but on some level we can and i mean one of those things is coming in contact with failure we can objectively ass assess that situation see what we did wrong and sort of imbue it with uh, you know con's hypothetical imperative well if i don't want this to happen right well then i should do something else and that seems to be it pretty objective way to derive the ethics of a situation um but yeah failure is a failure is a big one i i like to help people if i can get them comfortable with the concept of failure because it's just so valuable it's, it's mm -hmm. really it's like it's your grindstone it, it's what sharpens your blade but yeah well i feel like uh we could probably go on for a couple more hours but i gotta run but um anything any final last thoughts you had or no nothing in particular i i had a lot of fun with this i'll have you know and the audience this is my first ever youtube commentary video of any kind um <laughs> awesome i i hope you had fun and if you ever want to do this again trust me i'm i'm always game definitely yeah i'll definitely take you up on that um yeah thanks a lot garrett this was really really enjoyable uh, all right. I agree. Hey, take care now. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, man. Take care.